Hi, everybody. Great to see all of you. Welcome. My name is Lara Stemple. I'm an assistant dean here at UCLA at the law school. I'm also a faculty affiliate of our Center on Reproductive Health Law and Policy, and I serve on the executive committee of UCGHI. So I'm really delighted to be here, and I'm especially thrilled to moderate a panel of such three terrific speakers. And I'm so lucky, I, fe I feel so lucky, and you're so lucky that you get to hear them talk about their really important work um, here today. And I just want to start by briefly situating our panel in the broader context of the global movement for sexual and reproductive health and rights. So first with some data, this is UN Population Division data on women of reproductive age. I acknowledge this is a limited category because not all who need these services identify as women, but this is all we have for worldwide data. And among this population, 200 million women wish to avoid pregnancy but cannot access modern contraception. 45 million receive inadequate prenatal care or none at all. 30 million deliver babies outside of a health facility and there are 25 million unsafe abortions taking place each year. So in slightly brighter news, there has been over the last 30 years an overwhelming trend toward the liberalization of abortion laws globally. So you can see that here in this slide, 60 countries have increased legal access. And these 60 countries stand in sharp contrast to the US, of course. As everybody in this room probably knows, in 2022, the Supreme Court reversed 50 years of constitutional protection of the right to abortion in this country. The development of sexual and reproductive the development of sexual and reproductive health and rights globally can be found in a tremendous number of international instruments, too numerous to list, but they include UN declarations, world conferences, international treaties, recommendations from treaty monitoring bodies, regional agreements, guidances from UN bodies like WHO and UNAIDS. Um, this lists just some of them. And I'll give you an example of one that I think is important. So, the Maputo Protocol was adopted by the African Union in 2003. So it's the first ever legally binding international instrument to guarantee the right to abortion explicitly. However, it only guarantees it in cases of rape, incest, uh, to protect the life or physical or mental health of the pregnant person, and in the case of certain fetal diagnoses. Now, 45 out of 55 African Union states have ratified this protocol, and 12 of them have gone on to offer even greater protection than this. Um, and because of this protocol, that's the reason that the African region has shown more progress um, on abortion laws than any other country, than any other region in the last many years. But it also shows how abortion law is tricky. It's real progress. Um, these laws are better than the bans that predated them, but they're not perfect and, uh, and more needs to be done. I think it's really important for everybody to know that sexual and reproductive health and rights are very, very broad. So they include a huge number of important rights, including the rights to bodily integrity, privacy and autonomy, rights to define one's sexuality, including sexual orientation and gender identity and expression, rights to decide whether and when to be sexually active, the right to choose sexual partners and to safe and pleasurable sexual experiences, the right to decide whether, when, and whom to marry, and the right to determine the number and spacing of one's children. And all of these rights require access to information and services to achieve them. And those need to be guaranteed without discrimination, coercion, exploitation, or violence. So to realize this very broad range of rights, there are essential health services that are needed, and this slide lists many of them. Um, the ones we're going to talk about today on the panel are safe and effective prenatal childbirth and postnatal care and safe and effective abortion. And just to provide you with one final framework, reproductive justice. So this is a movement that began among a group of black women meeting in 1994 in Chicago uh, in the wake of a very important conference uh, on population and development that had been held in Cairo. And the group embraced a human rights frame and sought to respond to a top-down, predominantly white reproductive rights movement by creating Sister Song, 
a collective of women of color organizations, and they define uh, reproductive justice this way. The human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, to have children, to not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. So uh, this is a broad definition, and that's intentional. So it's meant to incorporate things like the over-policing of families of color, histories of forced and coercive sterilization, disproportionate rates of maternal mortality, and issues of economic uh, and environmental justice. So I wanted to give you that frame both because it's an, an important addition to the international framework I gave you and also because uh, it's an important one in the US, which is the context that some of our, the context that some of our panelists will be speaking about today. So without further ado, I am really excited to introduce you to our panelists. So we have Lucy Shalo Simwinga. She is a registered nurse midwife with GAIN at UCSF. She'll be our first panelist. Then Monica Lingarica, senior staff attorney, also with UCLA Law at our Center for Immigration Law and Policy. And Ushma Upadye, the co-director of UCGHI's Center for Gender and Health Justice and a professor at UCSF. So please join me in welcoming our first panelist, Lusa Shalo. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today, uh, attending the Global Health Day, and so honored to be standing in front of you. Um, I'm Lucy Shelo from Malawi. Um, so I'll be talking on the nursing and midwifery work workforce globally and in Malawi. Um, so I I'll just run through the, the slides uh, just to uh, present to you the dire state of the healthcare workforce globally and in Malawi. So that the WHO estimates a shortage of 10 million health workers by 2030, uh, especially in the uh, low and middle income countries like Malawi. So um, this shortage is mostly acute in nursing and midwifery. That means we have uh, less uh, nurse and midwifery uh, nursing and midwifery uh, health workers uh, uh, in globally and uh, in Malawi. So nearly 50% of the global health workforce uh, is comprised of nurses and midwives who also uh, represent more than 50% of the world's uh, current health worker shortage. So you can see that the backbone of the health uh, workforce comprises of nurse midwives, but, they, but then they're also uh, in, uh, in, a sh in a shortage. Um, so uh, that's just uh, presenting the projected increase of nursing stock by the WHO, but then it will mainly be in the high income countries. That means uh, there's, there'll still be a low workforce and shortage of nurse midwives in low income countries. Uh, so nurses and midwives are the uh, primary uh, providers of obstetric and neonatal care and may be the only provider someone sees during the, entire, uh, the entirety of their pregnancy. So in Malawi, as a pregnant woman can come to the health center or a hospital through the antenatal care, labor and delivery, and postnatal and be seen only by a midwife until family pl planning and all that. Um, so I, I know it's a different situation with the high income countries where an obstetrician or a doctor is involved, but then in Malawi, a lot of uh, uh, care is done by a midwife. So, um, but also approximately 90% of the world's midwives are women who experience uh, considerate gender disparities in pay, career pathways, and also decision-making power. They're not given that autonomy uh, to speak or also to make decisions uh, pertaining to patient care. Um, so for all countries to reach sustainable development goal number three, the world will need an additional of nine million nurses and midwives by the year uh, 2030. So that's a huge, um, a significant number that's uh, needed. Um, so, um, but then, uh, midwives save lives and money because as I've already said that um, 
like in low mid uh, income countries, midwives uh, can can be the only people who attend to patients and clients through the entirety of the pregnancies. So they won't even need uh, cesarean sections because midwives do not perform cesarean sections. They will only uh, provide the care that is uh, that does not include any surgical procedures. So that's why I'm just uh, justifying that midwives uh, save lives as well as uh, money. But then the shortage of midwives can be attributed to inadequate resources for training, uh, poor working conditions, understaffing, and also low pay. Because though these midwives, especially in low-income countries, work very hard, they are not. Um, they, they are subjected to poor working conditions, uh, burnout, and also low pay, uh, which also makes the professional uh, less desirable to pursue. So um, I'm just going to show you the maternal mortality um, globally in 2020. It was at um, 223 per 100,000 live births. So in the United States in 2021, it was 32.9 per 100,000 live births. But then in Malawi, it was, in, it was at 800, I mean 381 per 100,000 live births. That's quite a huge number because we, uh, we are aiming at 70 per 100,000 live births globally in 2030 as per our sustainable development goal number three. Uh, so on neonatal mortality um, ratio, globally, it's, uh, it was, in 2021, it was at 18 per 1,000 live births. In the United States, in 2022, it was 3.58 per 1,000 live births. And in Malawi, it was, um, in 2021, it was at 19.3 per 1,000 live births. And we're aiming at less than 12 by 2030. So that's, uh, we still have a long way to go, and we still need a lot of nurse midwives uh, to do this work to save um, maternal and uh, in the newborns. <coughs> so um, just a brief background on maternal health in Malawi. So the leading causes of maternal mortality in Malawi are hemorrhage, sepsis, and eclampsia. So hemorrhage is just um, bleeding after birth, and sepsis are infections, and eclampsia is one of the complications of um, hypertension in pregnancy. So maternal mortality has decreased from 439 per 100,000 live births in 2017 to 381 per 100,000 uh, live births in 2020. Wow, that means Malawi is doing a, a little bit great uh, to, to decrease the maternal mortality ratio, but then we still have a long way to go uh, to reach the, sus the, the sustainable development goal. So um, <coughs> this decrease can, uh, has been attributed to increased um, skilled birth attendance by 96%, and also increased in f uh, an increase in facility births. A lot of people now go to the facility uh, to have their babies. Uh, which uh, um, prevent a lot of complications. And also, um, so ongoing causes of poor outcomes include staffing shortages at facilities. As I've already said that um, in low-income countries like Malawi, they a lot, uh, they are sh there's a shortage of midwives and nurses. And also, um, quality of care, partly due to shortage of uh, drugs and other essential supplies. So, um, so in Malawi, the nursing ratio is one third of the WHO recommended 10 nurses per 10,000 people. So that means uh, as of 2020, only 3.4 nurses were taking care, um, nurse and midwives were taking care of 10,000 people. So you can see that's, that's, dire, that's dire shortage. And also, um, there is a huge vacancy rate for nurse and nurse midwives. So um, to build the, nursing work the nurse midwives workforce, uh, nursing and midwifery schools can take up to s seven years, uh, and also there's financial barriers, uh, and also there are strict measures by the IMF um, 
uh, and has, that has limited the employment of nursing and midwives in the public hospitals. Um, so I'm going to just rush through because my time is up. Uh, so to repair the gap, the global action in nursing, the project which I'm working in um, is a nurse-led project, uh, which is there to strengthen the nurse midwife workforce through short intensive trainings and longitudinal uh, bedside mentorship. That's uh, what I, I do um, as my day-to-day -day work. So it, has also, um, it also provides scholarships for those testing to get into nursing schools, scholarships for nurse trainings, and also uh, payment for um, uh, short trainings for nurses. So the mentorship model uh, replaces supervision model uh, to improve the morale of the nurses. So I'd like supervision where someone just come to find faults and all that. The model that GAIN uses is mentorship where uh, a mentor goes and will be there to work with the team. And also, it also equips nurses um, with uh, quality improvement skills and knowledge so that uh, the, the nurses and midwives can be able to uh, improve their workplaces. Yeah, so um, there are policies to address these issues, like advocating for, treat, uh, for the treatments of nurses and midwives um, as essential members of the workforce uh, with leadership capacity and QI abilities, and also advocating for, tra uh, for, the tra for their trainings and lifting the vo voices of nursing and midwives. Yeah, so that's it about uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa Shalo. I look forward to talking to you more as our discussion unfolds. In the meantime, we will hear from Monica. Please join me in welcoming Monica. Thank you, uh, Lucia Shello and Lara, for that really helpful context. Um, so as Lara mentioned, I am a senior staff attorney here at the Center for Immigration Law and Policy at UCLA Law. Um, but I'm actually based in San Diego, California, uh, near the US-Mexico border. Um, I was born and raised in the borderlands, and much of my work concerns US border policy and access to asylum and humanitarian protection in the United States. I am going to be talking today about an issue that is very much at the intersection of immigrants' rights and reproductive justice. Um, and specifically, what I'm going to talk about is the treatment of people who are pregnant, postpartum, and nursing, or who have other reproductive health needs, uh, while in the custody of immigration officials at the border. And so. Before I get into that, I want to do a very quick level set because um, lawyers often talk in like alphabet soup acronyms. And uh, so, you know, very broadly, the US Department of Homeland Security is the agency within the executive branch that is tasked in part, they have many different um, tasks, but in part with enforcing US immigration laws. Uh, within the Department of Homeland Security or DHS, there are several component or sub agencies. And we're going to be ta I'm going to be talking about two of those agencies today. One is one that you might recognize, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, which is generally the agency that is tasked with enforcing immigration laws in the interior of the country. Um, it's, I think, what DHS considers in its own language, it's, you know, uh, premier law enforcement agency. Um, but it's not the only one, right? So there are several component agencies within DHS, and one other agency that's very important um, and, and very, uh, uh, a, a very big part of the enforcement um, scheme at the border is Customs and Border Protection, or CBP. Uh, so CBP is, you know, again, generally in part tasked with enforcing immigration laws at the border and at spaces within the United States that operate like international borders. So this includes uh, international ports of entry at airports um, as well as uh, coastlines. Within CBP, there are uh, two additional, you know, CBP further breaks down, and the, you know, I'm gonna mention two sub-agencies or component agencies within CBP. One of those is the Office of Field Operations, which generally staffs, you know, I, I don't know if with a show of hands, folks wanna indicate who's ever crossed a land port of entry. 
So across the land border between the U.S. Mexico or between uh, the U.S. and Mexico, or the U.S. and Canada, um, or folks who've entered the U.S. through an international uh, airport. Okay, so the Office of Field Operations within CBP generally is um, uh, those are the folks who are the immigration officials who are dressed in navy blue, who check passports, state or you know, or visas, and review your luggage. Uh, U.S. Border Patrol is the agency that generally enforces immigration laws between official ports of entry, right? And so part of their mission, the mission they have assigned to themselves, um, is to prevent the unauthorized entry of, of individuals into the United States. Um, it's really important, I think, to understand that because for newcomers or new migrants who come to the United States, CBP, that agency I just mentioned, is kind of like the filter agency. It's the first stop that newcomers and migrants, whether they're coming through an official port of entry or between ports of entry, it's the first agency that they have contact with. And a lot of the treatment that they receive within that agency then determines you know, not only the, the, you know, how the rest of their legal cases will go if they're seeking to uh, defend or uphold their right to remain in the United States, but it can also you know, um, impact a lot of other things. And I'll, I'll talk about one of those things in a second. So, very briefly, don't, don't be alarmed by all of the text on this, on this slide. Um, I share this because my work at this intersection between reproductive justice and immigrants' rights started several years ago when I met a woman who would eventually become my client who shared with me a really harrowing story um, of having been forced to give birth in a border patrol facility and these facilities are often called yeleras, which is a Spanish word for ice box, because they're notorious for their freezing temperatures. Um, and I have to warn that this, this story or this anecdote is just like undeniably awful and, and maybe triggering to some folks. And I, and I think that it's really important um, to share it because it illustrates, I think, a lot of the horrors that people face in the custody of CBP. So my client was apprehended between ports of entry. You know, she was put in a position where, where she had to cross, um, cross between ports of entry. And she was apprehended while in active labor. And she was with her husband and two other children. And when Border Patrol agents apprehended her, rather than transport her to a hospital where she could, you know, um, be in safe conditions, to, or uh, be under conditions to give birth safely, they transported her to one of those yaleras, to one of those Border Patrol facilities. And unsurprisingly, um, within 20 minutes of having arrived, she was forced to give birth during routine processing while holding on to the edges of a garbage can for support. And she delivered a baby into her pants in front of numerous unknown men, border patrol agents, and also her husband who helped to deliver the baby heroically in the absence of a qualified medical professional. Um, after our client was taken off site to you know, eventually access uh, medical care, she was then forced to return to that Yelera for a night of postpartum detention with her newborn U.S. citizen baby. All of this, I should say, was completely avoidable. Um, it didn't have to happen. Uh, but so we filed an administrative complaint within the agent, with the agency. We brought a lot of attention to this case, um, ultimately seeking justice for our client, but also a policy that would prevent this from ever happening again. Um, we think, you know, CBP should not be detaining people who are pregnant, postpartum, or nursing, or people who have reproductive health needs. Um, and, uh, and, and I'll get in, into why in, in a second. Uh, but just very briefly, these are actually images from the report with official findings of our client's experience. And those photographs on the bottom are blurry. They're from CCTV footage. Um, but that is our client and her newborn US citizen baby wrapped in an aluminum blanket, um, again, while spending that night of postpartum detention. So I'm, I'm almost at time, but I just want to uh, be clear that ICE, so that agency that I mentioned that uh, is charged with enforcing immigration laws in the interior of the country, actively right now has a policy of presumptively not detaining people who are pregnant, postpartum, and nursing. Um, and you know, after a lot of the attention that we brought to the case about our client and, and after a lot of the advocacy, CBP issued its own policy. But rather than issue a policy of similarly not detaining people with these kinds of reproductive health needs, CBP's policy all but blesses the continued detention of this population, albeit with added, you know, and I say this in air quotes, but with added safeguards. And those safeguards, according to CBP, include milk, snacks, juice, um, and sometimes bassinets for babies. 
So to be very clear, you know, CBP saw this image and said what this needs is snacks and juice and maybe a bassinet for that baby. Um, so I'm going to be just uh, very clear here that this, the importance of people keeping people who are pregnant, postpartum, and nursing outside of the custody of immigration detention is relevant not just to ensuring that people have access to you know, give birth and care for their newborn babies in their safe conditions, it's also relevant for purposes like access to abortion and other needs that people have. Um, and so you know, I realize that I'm at time here, but I'm gonna just wrap up very quickly by saying that the, uh, for uh, many years, access to the needs that people have, the needs that people with reproductive health needs have, has been very conditioned you know, based on who's in power in the highest office in the United States. Um, and that is really detriment. It can be really detrimental to, to people, you know, like our client. Um, and sometimes it can be helpful. You know, under the Biden administration, the, the administration has gone, gone to great lengths to ensure that people in ICE custody do have access to abortion services, for example. But I think right now, more than ever, especially in the aftermath of Dobbs, which I know um, one of our colleagues is going to speak about. It's critical to understand that you know spaces and systems of confinement which inherently limit, if, if not entirely eliminate bodily autonomy, not just in terms of access to abortion and doctors, but also in terms of access to sunlight, you know, nutritious foods, the, the freedom to choose when and how and, and, and if you move, these spaces are categorically unsuitable for people with reproductive health needs. Um, and so, you know, what I offer is that the way to truly meet the needs of people who are subject to immigration enforcement is not just to make sure that they have, you know, whether it's snacks and juice and bassinets, or even access to abortion services, which are undeniably critical and important, but it's ultimately to envision a system that reduces the reach of those spaces and systems of confinement, and instead reimagines, you know, different ways to welcome uh, immigrants and, and protect the rights of newcomers in, in this country. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. I regret that it was a little hard to see the images of the newborn in custody, but when I, when I saw them on my computer when you submitted the slides, it gave me goosebumps and not in a good way to just see this newborn infant swaddled in on a concrete bench in a cell on security footage is chilling. And so I just wanted to underscore that. Thank you for that wonderful presentation and please join me in welcoming Ushma. Thank you so much, Laura and Monica, th for that uh, chilling story. Um, I, I'm so thrilled to be with you all here today. I'm Ushma Upadhyay. I'm a professor at UCSF, and I'm so privileged to be co-chair of co-chair of UCGHI's Center for Gender and Health Justice. Much of my research is focused on structural barriers to abortion care in the U.S. Um, as well as exploring ways to mitigate these barriers. The Dobbs decision in June of 2022 was a devastating blow to people who believe in reproductive autonomy and gender equality. But even before Dobbs, abortion care was already extremely hard to access in this country. People face a ton of restrictions. Um, and the, in the majority of the U.S. states, people can't use their Medicaid health care coverage to pay for their abortions. And so that's why we often hear that Roe was never enough. So as an example, in this slide shown on the left slide, on the left side of the slide, you can see this was distances people had to travel for to get, reach a clinic before Dobbs. And the, you can see the peach sections in the slide are, represent about two to four hours of driving time. And on the right, after Dobbs, the situation changed quite a bit. In many parts of the country, travel distances increased to four to eight hours. And then you can see in parts of Texas and Louisiana, in the lower, um, the dark peach, people have to travel now over eight hours hours to reach abortion care. So this is what we have today. The Dobbs decision made an almost extreme situation worse, exacerbating inequalities in abortion access. 
14 states, all of the ones in, in dark brown in this slide, now ban abortion, and another seven, the ones in the lighter shades, have gestational bans before viability. So I just want to make clear, you cannot access abortion um, in the red in all the states that are this dark brown color. So while abortion bans harm all people who may become pregnant, they cause even greater harm to those who are already subject to systemic racism and economic injustice. Black, Latina, and indigenous people, people living with low incomes, trans men and non-binary people, immigrants, adolescents, and people living with disabilities are all encountering compounded barriers to abortion care. The overturn of Roe has also exacerbated inequities in abortion access because the states that have banned abortions are the same states with the largest proportions of black residents. These are the same states that lack supportive policies that safeguard the health and safety of pregnant people, their children, and families, such as Medicaid expansion, uh, uh, parental leave, uh, child care options, making the costs of being denied an abortion even higher. Okay, but I'm from UCGHI's Center of Gender and Health Justice. So uh, we're all about empowerment, so I can't, um, I can't stop before talking about some of the proactive measures that are taking place. States across the country are passing pr proactive policies, and this includes making funding available for patients from out of state uh, to get abortion care in state. They're funding more training for nurse practitioners in abortion care so people can get this care from their primary care provider within their, their own communities from people um, who look like them, who they can trust. And my favorite proactive policy is passing shield laws that legally protect clinicians who offer telehealth abortion care to people living in abortion bans states. Okay, so that's my visual of these shield laws. So there are now six states, including California, that just passed in January. Woohoo! Um, so tele telehealth removes structural barriers to care and makes it more accessible. Because it can be done through secure messaging, people, some people don't even have to have a video consultation with their, their clinician. It's all done through, through texting, secure messaging with their provider. They don't have to have an appointment. They don't have to secure travel or find childcare. Some people are doing it from work, um, from their jobs. And so we're seeing a greater number of telehealth abortions than ever. Today it accounts for 16% of all abortions are done by telehealth. And this, um, the September 2023, the, the big jump, is because of those shield laws. We, uh, we were counting all of the, the abortions that were taking place within the healthcare system, and starting in July, we could start counting these because we consider them legal abortions provided into banned states. So the banned states don't consider them legal, but the, the states with the shield laws do consider them legal. And so um, while it, these laws protect the clinicians providing the care, um, they may not be legally safe for, pop, for the populations in these banned states. And so people who are at higher risk for being targeted for criminalization, we all know black and brown people. And so there are some risks, uh, but for some people who are unable to travel, such as adolescents and people without a car, this may be their only hope. So in the biggest abortion case since Dobbs on March 26th, that's just in a couple weeks, the Supreme Court will hear arguments about whether several of FD the FDA's recent regulatory uh, changes to expand access to medication abortion, including the ability to offer telehealth, was based in sufficient evidence. The plaintiffs are saying that uh, the FDA didn't have enough safety evidence. 
Um, we just published a very large study of over 6,000 patients who received telehealth abortion care in Nature Medicine, and we found that the, the safety and effectiveness rates are the same as in-clinic abortion care. And so we know that the research shows that those concerns are politically motivated and unfounded. We can only hope that the justices base their decision on science. So stay tuned for more on that case. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ushma. So thank you to all the panelists. It's such a treat to be able to hear from a provider, a lawyer, a researcher um, on different topics, but topics that are also, of course, interrelated and connected in lots of ways. Um, I always find that when you get such a terrific panel, it's nice to give them an opportunity to talk to one another. So I just wanted to open up um, by asking you to reflect or ask questions about any of the other um, talks that you heard. What were you nodding along to, able to relate to? What was illuminating or surprising for you? Um, really just open to discussion among the three of you. start? Um, well, I, I think the um, workforce shortages really, I found a lot of connections um, with Lucy Cello's presentation in terms of training um, clinicians so uh, to, to be able to expand access to care. Um, that's one of California's, uh, California's devoting substantial funding to training um, nurse practitioners in medication abortion care so that we can devolve the model of care so people don't have to go to clinics, Planned Parenthoods um, to get an abortion. They can go to their local um, primary care clinic and that way they can avoid protesters or the stigma and they can just, you know, abortion care should be integrated into um, primary care and so that is a way I saw a nice connection. Um, I, I think I got a bit shocked with the presentation by Monica where uh, she, she talked about uh, the woman who, Can I use my phone? Uh, the woman who had to deliver in a, in a cell holding to a garbage can. And I was thinking about the protection of the baby from infections uh, while the whole world is talking about um, uh, decreasing maybe neonatal infections and neonatal mortality. And that had to happen. So I was a bit shocked and uh, um, uh, I, I think I just had to, to let this out on uh, like, that how, uh, what are the policies and the measures that are there to protect these in innocent newborns when it comes to um, situations like those? Thank you. Um, I will just add that I, every, what you just shared is exactly, I think, what we, you know, tried to ring a lot of a lot of alarm bells about, um, and we actually have partnered with medical professionals and um, an OBGYN and, and organizations that have as their mission, you know, the expansion of access to safe medical care to be able to speak with authority on, on sort of why those kinds of conditions are just abhorrent and, and unsuitable both for, um, you know, a, a person who's in the posture where they're going to give birth and also for a baby. Um, I had two reflections. Oh my gosh, sorry. I had two reflections. Uh, one was just one of the one of the common threads that I noticed across the presentations is just the acute impact of disparate resources on m communities that are already marginalized or already oppressed in different ways are just you know the the uh, 
the problem with disparate resource is so much more compounded in communities that are already subject to marginalization, I think is one thing that you know, resonated both like on a very local level, but also you know, clearly very globally as well. Um, but another thing that resonated is just like, in spite of this moment that we're in, you know, which is I think undeniably a, a pretty tough moment in the aftermath of Dobbs and you know, with the different challenges that the panelists spoke to, you know, I think there's a great uh, deal of energy and momentum around identifying the solutions that are still viable, even within this context. I think that remains critical to maintain the momentum regardless of sort of uh, you know, what may be happening that is beyond our control. Thank you for those comments. I, I have one question for Lisa Shalo. Uh, you mentioned a few times the sustainable development goals, which is of course one of the elements that um, we can find productive health and rights um, in, in really close and it's still not working. I'm gonna go back to this one. I was hoping that you could uh, just tell us a little bit about how those benchmarks operate in Malawi. So, so you know, you have these goals, you seem to be measuring Malawi's progress against them. Could you say a little bit more about how that works in practice? I, I think when you cut, I, I couldn't connect your question, so maybe you should. Can you just talk about the sustainable development goals and how you use them as a benchmark to measure progress? Oh, okay, so um, we mainly, in the work that I do, we concentrate on um, this sustainable development goal number three, uh, where we are all aiming at uh, reducing the maternal mortality ratio to 70 by 100,000 uh, live births by the, uh, by the year 2030. So uh, there are a number of interventions that are being done uh, in my country, uh, which, uh, some of uh, which are uh, making sure that the women are delivering in, in a hospital where I was presenting that about 90, above 90% 90 of the women are delivering in the hospitals so that maybe when they have a complication, any complication, uh, those that I stated on uh, the main causes of maternal deaths in Malawi, when they have such complications, they are in the hospital and they are managed accordingly instead of maybe when they were uh, at a traditional birth attendant or at home, uh, when a woman starts bleeding, they, there's no way or there's no measure how they can be uh, managed and, uh, 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 so that uh, we can prevent maternal deaths. So what, that's one of the interventions that are being done in Malawi. And also previously in the, um, in the early 90s, there were a lot of traditional birth attendants who were conducting uh, births in their homes and the births were unsafe. Yeah, so in those, in those days, we had a, a lot of mat, um, maternal deaths, up to 600, 1,000 to, to 600 um, maternal deaths, uh, 100,000 uh, life births. So these interventions that have been put in place, like the uh, skilled birth attendants, also um, anti, anti, focused antenatal care, and um, uh, family planning and all that are the interventions that we're working uh, so as to um, um, reach the goal by 2030. Yeah. Do any other panelists want to speak or ask any questions? Otherwise, we'll move to Ashma. Of maternal mortality. That's something that um, we're keeping an eye on, looking at the impact of the Dobbs decision. Um, not so much from unsafe abortion, because the self-managed abortion in the U.S. tends to be with mifepristone and misoprostol, and it does tend to be very safe. But it's more the people who are experiencing complications from pregnancy aren't able to get abortion care. So we're talking about people um, who, are, who are, have threatened um, miscarriages or um, life-threatening fetal anomalies um, women are forced to give birth to babies who they know um, have conditions that are incompatible with life. And so, sorry, this is infant mortality, not uh, maternal mortality, but they're forced to carry um, pregnancies to term um, even when the fetus is, um, you know, missing, 
you know, heart or, or brain, you know. So I think there's a lot of uh, negative outcomes that I think we're not, uh, I think we're, uh, that are very tragic and uh, wasn't, they weren't really thought through. And undoubtedly, we'll find that they have disproportionate impacts on communities of color, low-income people, and so on. Absolutely, the people yeah. who cannot um, leave the state to, to receive this life-saving care. Thank you for that. Okay, so we are, are we out of time for this, or we can go to Q&A? Okay, so we have a little bit of time for Q&A. Please step forward if you would like to ask a question of our panelists. Yes. Patricia, if you speak loudly, that might work, and I can also try to repeat back your question or comment if it's short. Okay. Yes. I am Patricia okay. F.A. I work with Partners in Health based in Sierra Leone. My question goes to the speaker that told us that story of the woman that delivered in the detention camp. I just want to know how you monitor this woman's mental health. And if any woman that has delivered in such a condition suffered from postpartum psychological disorders, and how quickly do you get health providers to attend to these mothers? Then for the abortion, have you ever had a case of incomplete abortion? How did you manage post-abortion care? Thank you. I can actually, can I? Yeah. I guess the, as to the first part of the question, um, I should say that access to information about practices generally in, within the custody of any immigration agency in the United States, that's ICBP and others, is incredibly difficult to obtain. So these agencies are characterized by opacity or a just total lack of transparency. And that's even more so pronounced in the case of CBP. So it's very hard for us, even when we are, you know, do come across certain cases, which for me is only possible because of my geographic proximity to the border. I work at the border and so I interact with a lot of organizations who serve, you know, people like my client directly, and that's how I get information. But Anything beyond, you know, our, my client's testimony and the documents that she has, it's, it's nearly impossible to obtain it. And so when we talk about monitoring any kind of health of the people, whether that's physical health, maternal health, mental health, um, of people who are subject to confinement in these spaces, it's incredibly difficult. It, it really is only made possible through the testimonies of, of the people that we serve. And sometimes in the case of like public records requests so that we are able to actually obtain medical documentation. But even, I guess it's just all to say that even when our clients are able to access adequate medical care, sometimes they're not even given the documents that speak to, you know, any, anything related to any conditions that they may have, um, including mental health. I will also say that the uh, access to mental health services generally within immigration custody is just like, it's abysmal. I, I used to represent almost exclusively people who were entitled to lawyers because of mental incapacity issues. Um, and the treatment that those individuals have within the immigration, or the custody of the immigration agencies is also just, it's not only a problem with documentation and knowing what, you know, what people are experiencing, but it's also a problem with the lack of treatment and, and diagnosis that happens in those spaces as well. Um, that sounds really grim, um, but I, you know, want to say that it's not just me, but there are a lot of organizations that are fighting for, actively advocating for, you know, more transparent policies and, and better treatment for people in, in, uh, who are subject to this kind of confinement. Um, so I'll, I'll end there, just to not end on a, on a grim note. So 
about 3% of people who use medication abortion will have an incomplete abortion. Um, so that is expected. Uh, usually they speak to the provider that, um, that prescribed the medications. Uh, they can go back to the clinic if they were, went in person, or they can go to a, a hospital, an emergency room to, um, to have an additional, to have a procedure to complete the abortion. Um, in terms of pe people living in states with abortion bans, that's where the risk of criminalization comes in. We know that people who go into emergency rooms seeking medical care, that's the most common way that people who self-manage their abortions are reported to the authorities. It is the hospital staff that report them as having a suspected uh, self-managed abortion. And then they, that's when the criminalization takes place. Any other questions from the audience? How much time do we have? None. We have none. Okay. Well, please join me in giving a very, very warm thank you to our incredible series of panelists. Well, thank you so much again for our panelists, Laura and Lucia Shello, Monica.